Hey, John here. Let's look at the standard library copy algorithm. I'm over here at CPP Reference. If you come over here and click on Algorithms Library, scroll down, there's all sorts of stuff in here. And one of the things you will find is this right here, copy and copy if. And we get the details of the standard copy algorithm. So what is it? How do we use it, right? Okay, a couple of different versions. They upgraded it over the years. Uh, as far as we're concerned, they're all going to work the same, whether it's the old version or the new. There's pretty subtle differences. Um, the basic form right here works by grabbing an open-ended range for its input and it gets a single iterator for its output okay as the doc says it'll copy the in, the elements from the input range right from first to last into another range beginning at d first okay which is the destination now notice it said to another range not to another container right that means you can actually use this to copy, you know, make copies of things in the same container as well, right? Well, of course, you have to take pay attention to this caveat down here. If you do copy from uh, one place to another place in the same container, you have to be careful if the destination is part of the range that your your source copy elements are coming from. Okay, so you have to be careful because it'll be a destructive or otherwise uh, undefined uh, if you do that. So they provide a backwards copy in that case, right? Is if it overlaps and you do it backwards, you won't have the you won't have the problem of a destructive overlap. Okay, okay. So let's let let's keep it simple and use two different containers and look and see what happens here. So we got an open-ended range uh, for the input and a single iterator for the output, and this re uh, marks the first element in the destination range with which we're going to overwrite the values, okay? I'll be careful, this is copying. It's gonna copy the values of the elements in this input range into overwriting the values of elements in the output range. So the output doesn't insert new elements, okay? It, it replaces elements that are already there. So let's look at some code here. Uh, first of all, we gotta include the algorithm header because copy is part of the algorithm library. And then whatever you need for the kind of containers you wanna use, we're gonna keep it simple. We're gonna just use a vector here, all right? So I'm gonna create a vector. I'm gonna fill it up with a bunch of stuff, okay? Then I'm gonna print it out. And then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna copy, I'm gonna create a new iterator that's set to the begin plus four, all right? So here's begin, right? plus one, two, three, four. So this is the beginning of my input range, and the input range will end at the end of the container, which is, you know, one past the end down there. So this range should copy these four elements from the input vector and place them into our output vector. So where's the output vector gonna come from? That's down here. I'm gonna call that one vec2. It's this, it has to have the same, or at least a compatible um, uh, element type so the copy can work, right? So I'm gonna copy from, from uh, this vec from up here, and I wanna write them into vec2. And like I said, it has to replace existing elements. If I didn't put anything in this vector down here, or if it wasn't big enough to hold all those, this would fail, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just put in 10 elements and set them to XXX. So what are we gonna then do? We're gonna say copy from the beginning to the ending of the input range, right? The last four of the vec from, and we're gonna put it at the beginning of this vec two. And then when we're done with that, it will pair out both the, the input and the output vectors to make sure we see what's going on. Okay, so here's the uh, values in the input vector. And after the copy, the input vector is unchanged. They're the same in the output vector. You can see the first one, two, three, four elements were replaced. You know, they used to be all these triple X's. There were 10 of those in here, and now the first four get replaced. So that's what copy does, all right? And just to make sure that we really understand this really well, let's go ahead and do something like this and say begin say plus three and run it again, right? Because we can obviously copy it into the middle of the destination. 
And obviously, at this point, it skipped the first three and put the four of them right there. Okay? Now, I don't know what it's going to do. I've never tried, to be honest with you, and certainly not on purpose, to do this incorrectly. Let's go ahead and set this to eight because we know it won't fit now. Let's see what happens. Of course, it'll compile because the compiler doesn't know what you're trying to accomplish. Now, it appears that we got these two and it threw the other ones away. All right? But what about our friend Valgrind? What does that have to say about this? I have a feeling that it's going to tell us it's broken. Okay? So what did it do? We got all kinds of errors up here. Yikes. That's a real noisy problem. Uh, my point is it doesn't work. Okay? And the library is not helping you. All right? Because immediately the thing uh, becomes destroyed once you start writing past the end of your vector. So if we sift through all this, we'll probably find some clues as to what went awry. Okay? If you add up how many bytes are allocated in the vector and so on. This one, it wrote off the end of the space that was allocated to hold that vector. If you change the capacity of the vector, you could probably fool Valgrind into thinking it's okay because it would not be writing outside your program's address space. And uh, it might not complain at that point. But uh, my point is that in one way or another, this is flawed, and not just in a way where the, the execution environment helps you by just saying, well, there's only two, let's throw the other ones away. No, you just screwed up and you destroyed all this memory and your program uh, you know, screwed up is what happened. So let's look at this other example now. Now, if you're familiar with a unary predicate, this one is copy if. So let's go up here and look, right, because we got copy and we also have copy if. So let's look and see what copy if does. All right, it's got the same thing going on for the open-ended range of input, and it adds this predicate down here. And down here it says, okay, if you're going to use this version 3, which I'm looking at right here, that's what this 3 here refers to, right? Uh, then it'll only copy the elements for which the predicate P, uh, pred returns a true. Relative order of elements are copied, are, are preserved, and so on. So what it's going to do is it's going to iterate from first to last, skipping anything that this thing says is false. All right. So what do we got going on here? I wrote a predicate function here that will return true if the string that it is given has a length of 5. So if we said copy the entire vec from into vec2, and we use that predicate function, which you'll see is down here, it will only copy those items whose length are 5. So we'll have an apple and a, what, a, a daisy and an eagle maybe, okay? And those will be the only ones that end up in the vec2. Again, I'm going to create 10 elements that have junk values. You could just as easily create 10 elements that have nothing at all in there. But if I left them completely blank, what would happen down here when I print it out, we wouldn't be able to see the empty one, you know, the blank ones, so to speak. The triple X ones. They would still be there, and they would have a value. It would be a string with no characters in it. And, and, and if you then ran this uh, uh, loop here, it would be uh, potentially confusing to the student. All right? Uh, so let's actually do this. It just occurred to me this might even be more interesting. Let's put single quotes around each of these elements, okay? Now we'll actually be able to see what they all are, and then we'll play around with this in a minute. Okay, so how do you call this one? Instead of copy, it's copy if. You got the usual input range and the output range, uh, the beginning of the output range. This time I'm going to just do the entire input vector and just put them at the beginning of the output vector using the predicate function, and this hasn't changed since the, since the last example code other than the quotes that I just added. So we know how that all works. Let's try this one. Okay. So, remembering that the predicate used in here says if the string length equals 5, return true. And of course, that's where we got Apple, Daisy, Eagle, because these are the only ones that have five characters in those strings. And you can see all the values have quotes around them because of the way I modified this loop down here. Now let's go ahead and try this and not give them any initial values. All right. 
This will initialize them all to the what the default constructor of this type will do, and that is to create a string that has no characters in it. So if we run this one, is my point, this would not have been obvious, okay? So in this example, that's why I put those triple X's in there, just to make sure everything's clear. And of course, as is the case with predicate functions, you could always uh, substitute, if you wanted to, a class in here and specify a class instance that has an overloaded function operator that takes the right kind of data, okay? And use that as your predicate as well. So that's all there really is to copying, all right? Thanks for watching. See you next time.